Bank robbery isn't just a crime. Getting in, getting out, not getting caught afterwards. It's also an act of imagination. And while the mastermind behind La Casa de Papel has said that the show doesn't pull from any one real heist, it's hard to imagine that the criminal creativity shown by real robbers didn't inspire some of the professor's wild plans. These are some of the most audacious real bank heists ever, all carried out using different and even creative methods. The professor can seemingly find any vehicle that the heist demands, and he's actually not alone in that amongst bank robbers. Perhaps the most creative vehicle usage happened in 2009, in and above the Stockholm suburb of Vesbadia. Around 5 in the morning, a stolen civilian helicopter landed on the roof of a cash depot owned by security company G4S and dropped off a squad of robbers armed with guns and explosives. As they went to work inside raiding the cages, the airborne thieves and their allies also managed to keep the responding police forces totally grounded. First, they planted suspected explosives in the police hangar, preventing any helicopters from taking off, and then they cleared the roads around the depot using the ancient weapon of caltrops. The thieves got away that day and ditched the chopper, but seven of the helicopter bandits were convicted of the crime a year later. The 5.3 million, though? Its location is largely still up in the air. While an aerial assault certainly captures attention, a skilled bank robber can get pretty far with a solid ground game, an underground game. You'll notice that the professor and co spend a lot of time digging. It's actually hard to pick just one real tunnel heist because they're all riveting. But the robbery of the Banco Central, Brazil's central bank, in the northern city of Fortaleza, stands out for its sheer size and considerable creativity. Beginning in March 2005, robbers tunneled 80 meters from a rented property to the central bank's vault, breaching it five months later on a weekend in August when staff was nowhere to be found. The tunnel was lit and wood paneled, it even had rudimentary air conditioning. Police later estimated it cost $200,000 to build. And the thieves showed such attention to detail. They set up a landscaping business offering synthetic grass, complete with advertising and promotional baseball hats, so that no one questioned all that dirt from the digging. In only a few days, their tunnel allowed them to liberate 7,716 pounds of currency via a pulley system, and it was untraceable, uninsured. When the crime was finally noticed, police found little but a white powder that the gang had spread to foil fingerprinting. The robbers scattered, 11 cars headed in different directions across Brazil. Some were arrested, a truly shocking number were kidnapped and held for ransom by other criminals, and some went on to other scores. But maybe none of them reached the same heights as when they were underground. But we're not quite done with Brazilians yet. Because as the professor demonstrates over and over again, the same old robber can pull off a brand new heist. They just need to dream up a new identity. Which is exactly what happened on another August weekend in Sao Paulo in 2011. A group of 12 men easily passed through a security checkpoint at a branch of Banco Itau, located on Brazil's Wall Street. They all wore the same gray uniform and told the guards they were there to replace furniture, which checked out staff knew of the bank's ongoing renovations. But once inside, the movers subdued the armed guard on the main floor and forced him to both turn off the alarms and open the doors for a second team, armed with industrial grade power tools designed to get to the vault security deposit boxes. We don't know everything that was in them. Weirdly, only five out of the 120 victims filed a police report. But we know there were huge diamonds, bars of gold, and a watch collection more expensive than an apartment. After 10 hours of casual looting, at some point they even ordered fast food, the costume thieves escaped, and only later did we learn their true identities. They were some of the same old robbers who hit Fortaleza six years earlier, back for something new.
At only $400,000 and taking place in a tiny town in Washington state, one might wonder why this heist deserves inclusion. But imagine this, it was a crime so creative that even the prosecutor commended the robber for planning it. And a lot of that is due to its use of decoys. The fake out is also a staple of the professor's bank robbing playbook. Throughout his heists, he used decoy robbers, decoy getaway cars, decoy government assassins. He even builds a decoy wall at one point. So the professor would probably be a fan of the Washington State Bandit, who in September of 2008 posted an ad on Craigslist offering high hourly wages for landscapers who should show up at a bank parking lot wearing yellow vests, blue shirts, safety goggles, and respirators. At the appointed time, the robber showed up wearing the exact same outfit but he went straight for an armored car security guard, pepper spraying him and grabbing his bag of money. With the multiple identical landscapers obscuring his crime, the thief stripped off his Velcro lined clothes and, this is not a joke, hopped on a waiting inner tube to float to a getaway car. But all of the robber's decoys couldn't stop the police from later identifying the DNA from his mask. Still, cheers to creativity. As a bank robber on the professor's crew, sometimes you need a lot of patience. But at other times, you just need a lot of explosions. In Beirut in 1976, one group of robbers dreamed up a similar scheme, balancing composure on one hand and explosive brute force on the other as they plundered the British Bank of the Middle East. It happened during the chaos of Lebanon's civil war, so even today, rumors still swirl about the culprits. The PLO is considered the main suspect, but a rival Lebanese Christian political party and even the Corsican Mafia have been implicated as well. It's a strange mix. But the plan itself was pretty straightforward. First, the robbers blasted into the building. According to one colorful account, they secured an empty lobby with grenade launchers under the cover of mortar fire. But most just say they blew a hole through the wall of a neighboring church, right into the heart of the bank. Then, possibly with the help of the Mafia safecrackers, they blasted into the vaults themselves. So lots of explosions. But then the robbers patiently spent at least two days in the bank, loading three trucks with their loot. Protected by both their guns and the din of civil war around them. So if you ever thought La Casa de Papel was unrealistic, just remember, all those explosions over all that time, and we've still never caught those who blasted their way out of a Beirut bank with $210 million. But maybe you don't wanna use all that messy force. For discerning bank robbing masterminds, the inside man has a certain grace. Recruiting one can mean valuable information about the scene or even the potential for quiet sabotage, which is why the professor does it and why the gang responsible for one of the biggest peacetime cash heists did it too. It happened in a small town in Kent, England, the county just southeast of London, at a Securitas cash depot, a kind of unassuming warehouse for cash from banks and retailers. The thieves, allegedly led by an actual mixed martial arts contender, first seduced an underappreciated inside man to their side, who videotaped every inch of the depot using a tiny camera affixed to his belt. So they knew they had to take elaborate steps to disguise themselves from the many cameras inside, even hiring a makeup artist to fashion prosthetic noses and chins. They also knew they couldn't get in without a pass, so they kidnapped the depot manager and his wife and child and forced him to let them in. The professor is not above threatening a family man either. In cualquier lugar que puedas imaginar. Boom. With the employees restrained at gunpoint, the robbers filled a truck with cash and made off with the loot after only an hour. It was pure precision, the kind you can only get with someone on the inside, according to both cops and robbers. From a robber's point of view, this was a good inside man. But in many cases, the inside man turns out to be the crew's weakest link. Cops look for them on big bank jobs. It didn't happen in Kent because the robbers basically left all kinds of clues around their homes, including a fingerprint smudge floor plan of the depot, but an inside man famously crumbled under police pressure and named names in the 1983 London Brinks Matt robbery. So, inside men, 
They may be a dream in the beginning, but it's a dream that might turn into a nightmare by the end. Futuristic gadgetry. It's something you expect out of a sophisticated bank heist. But as the professor's crew demonstrates, sometimes the low-tech solution has value too. Both low and high were on display in Antwerp in 2003 in what commentators called the heist of the century. The target was the Diamond Center in the city's Diamond District, a notoriously secure location, but one with a mouth-watering turnover of $54 billion per year. Enter the alleged Italian mastermind. Like any good bank robber, he first did reconnaissance, renting a security deposit box that allowed him regular access to the vault. And he concluded that it was impossible. The vault was too well defended. So how did it happen that a guard later walked into a vault one Monday to find it robbed of at least $100 million in diamonds? The answer is that in the intervening months, the robber and his crew got extremely tech savvy. On the high-tech side, they placed a fingertip-sized camera on a wall, which fed its signal to electronics housed in a working fire extinguisher nearby, all to record guards as they entered in a combination to the vault. That same camera picked up the location of a second physical key to the door too. But the low-tech side is even better. Maybe the most diabolical system the vault had was its magnetic alarm, two fastened magnets that sent a signal to the police if their attraction was ever broken by someone opening the vault door. The crew defeated it with a simple slab of aluminum. It affixed to the magnets and prevented them from detaching so that the robbers could unbolt the alarm and slide it out of the way. Once inside the vault, there was more, heat sensors that could spell doom for the diamond thieves. But once again, they had a response. The day before the heist, the main robber coated the sensor with hairspray, which prevented it from detecting the temperature changes that would trigger it. All in all, there were at least eight such devices that the thieves successfully countered, many using low-tech solutions like tape and styrofoam. So bank robberies aren't all just James Bond gadgets. Sometimes a James Bond hair product will do. Whether it's from the air or the ground, with high tech or low, via a disguise or a decoy or brute force or an insider advantage, real life proofs there's no shortage of ways to pull off a heist if you're just a little creative. After watching the show, we wondered, has there ever been a scuba diving heist? The answer is, well, not quite, but kind of close. Thieves in Belgium used diving tanks to get through narrow sewer pipes up to a vault, and a bank robber in Washington state grabbed scuba gear to make an aquatic getaway before being tackled by police. Clearly, there's something in the water in Washington state.